Hi, it's really great to be speaking here today. I'm Miriam Quick, and I'm going to be talking today about my shortlisted project, Bristol Burning, which takes a year of air quality data from a UK city and turns it into sound. But here's a, a first a bit about me. I'm a data journalist based in the UK. I write data stories and I work on data viz pieces for clients with creative agencies. I particularly like to explore unusual ways of working with data. So I create data artworks, often in collaboration with others. I enjoy working across different media. I've turned data into everything from charts and graphics to books to necklaces. A common thread in my work is that I like to create not just data-driven things, but experiences whose shape, structure, or quality is determined by a data set. These experiences are often multi-sensory. They can be auditory or tactile, as well as visual. I'm also a musician, and I'm particularly interested in turning data into sound, a practice known as data sonification. With Duncan Gear, I run a sonification studio called Loud Numbers, which you can find at loudnumbers.net. Loud Numbers started as a podcast where each episode we turned a different data story into a music track. There are five episodes in our podcast with tracks in various musical styles from techno and jungle right through to classical. We have episodes on everything from insect decline to the taste of beer, all based on data. In the third episode, Boom and Bust, we use data on the US economy since 1968 to dictate the drum pattern in a jungle track. When the economy grew, the drums play forwards like normal. But when it was in recession, we reverse the sample so it plays backwards. Listen out for another sample saying, cool down the dance hall when the economy starts to cool down. And be warned, this one starts a little bit loud. <laughs> podcast but today I'm going to talk about a different project it's a sonic art project I worked on last year called Bristol Burning in this project I transformed a year of city air quality data into sound this was my starting point in the city of Bristol in the southwest of the UK air pollution kills up to 260 people a year that's five people every week in a city of under half a million most of these deaths are because of particulate matter minute particles released by burning and traffic. Breathing in even tiny amounts of these particulates is very unhealthy, raising your risk of everything from lung cancer to heart attacks and strokes. So air pollution is bad for you. But we all know this already, right? We read so many articles, seen so many visualizations, used so many air quality apps. It's really easy to disengage. So I thought, what if instead of seeing this air pollution data on a chart or reading a statistic, you could actually hear it. Sounds and especially music are a brilliant way of engaging the emotions, making you feel something. Would sonifying this data make it feel more real, more important? And could the sheer novelty of hearing air quality changes help circumvent people's usual defenses against this kind of unsettling information? Bristol Burning was commissioned by Knoll West Media Centre, an art centre in Bristol. And this was my brief to create a sonic artwork using open air quality data from the city of Bristol to engage the local community with an air quality campaign. This campaign was called Slow the Smoke and was being run alongside a research project of the same name by Knoll West, Bristol City Council and the University of the West of England. The Slow, Slow the Smoke project was designed to investigate how the use of wood burners affects air quality in an inner city area called Ashley Ward. This area includes the district of St Paul's, which is, has a large Afro-Caribbean community and a rich musical tradition. As part of the project, they recruited volunteer citizen scientists living locally, who made their own air quality sensors and stuck them outside their houses. The data from these sensors was then uploaded to Open Data Bristol, which is where I accessed it. I downloaded a year's worth of data from the 1st of August 2021 to 31st of July 2022. And in total, I took data from 14 different sensors. And this map on the right shows where they were located within Ashley Ward. 
And this, this is what that year of air quality data looked like. So the chart on the left, this shows the raw readings for large particulates or PM10, and each sensor has a different color on the chart. So you can see it's pretty noisy. There's a lot of these very short term peaks and not all the sensors are switched on at the same time. So to solidify this data, I decided to strip out some of the noise to radically simplify it. And in the end, I reduced it to just 12 numbers. And these are the monthly average PM10 readings aggregated across all the sensors. And this you can see plotted in the chart on the right. So you might notice there are these big spikes in the middle of the chart. Now these correspond to January and March that year. And you might also notice a general kind of arc shape to the chart. It kind of goes up in the middle and down at the end. And this is because air quality gets worse in winter and better in summer. And in fact, this is a very common pattern in many, in many places and Bristol is no exception. Smoke from wood burners is one reason for this, but the main reason is it's cold in winter in the UK, and when cold air sinks, it traps pollution near the ground. So these particularly big spikes in January and March were when the weather was very cold and very still, little wind. So when I saw this data, when I saw the arc shape, I thought that looks like a very musical pattern. It kind of goes up in the middle and down at the end, like a lot of music tracks. So I wondered how it would actually sound. So I took these 12 numbers and I turned them into sonic artwork. There are actually three different layers of sound in this artwork and they all play over each other at the same time. So the first layer is the sonification itself. This represents the monthly average particulate levels over the course of a year, those 12 numbers. It's a drone sound and it gets louder and harsher when the particulate levels were higher. So here's what it sounds like in the summer when levels were low. This is very quiet. So hardly anything there, just a very low rumble. And this is what it sounds like in the winter when particulate levels were high. <laughs> So a lot louder and it's also a really kind of scary and ugly sound. This felt right because remember we're talking about airborne particles that, that kill people. The second layer of sound is a music track. Now this track is influenced by dub and dancehall, um, partly to play homage to Bristol's musical tradition, but to be honest mostly just because I like this kind of music. I made the track using Logic Pro and I use various sample libraries. So here's how the track sounds by itself. So it's kind of upbeat, it's quite danceable, it is a dance hall track. But when it has the drone layered over the top of it, it sounds overall pretty different. The drone really gets in the way of your appreciation of the music, doesn't it? It almost drowns it out like the music's being stifled or choked. And I guess you could see a kind of metaphor in this for how air pollution stifles local communities. It shortens people's lifespans. And then finally, there's the vocal layer. So here I work with a brilliant musician who's called T. Relly, and that's him in that picture. And he composed and recorded the vocals. His lyrics, they don't directly comment on the data, but they riff quite loosely off the topic of air quality. And they relate it to his experiences of growing up in Bristol, and they express, express feelings of frustration that nothing is happening to sort out the problem. Um, I should point out that since the track was made, Bristol has opened the clean air zone. So stuff is happening, but very, very slowly. At Loud Numbers, Duncan and I really like including voices in our sonification work. It gives the result a much more human quality and it draws out the emotional aspects of the story that we're telling. Bellis is actually not the only voice on the track. 
I took part in a community open day run by Nell West Media Centre, in which local people got to try out sonification for themselves. I ran a workshop where people read these charts that you can see here, and they played the wind and the weather data from the last year using drums, using voices, um, using those wind tubes that you whirl around your head to make a sound. And during this event, I sampled local people saying the names of each of the months of the year, so January, February, March, and so on. And I chopped these samples up and I just positioned them at the correct point in the track. So they're almost like axis labels on a visualization. So let's play part of the final track that includes the vocals. And I was fortunate enough to work with some really good filmmakers called Rosanna Wachowski and Esme Rose Warren. And they created this music video, which was shot in the district of St. Paul's and from which the previous screenshots were taken. Where do you go for your fresh air? And is the disparity less compare? Who will speak up now? Who will dare? I'm not making it up when the peaks are long way, kill up, wake up, something's coming, my city's on fire, so the old place but in front, let no close, all stand drive, it's amazing, all the people stay alive, cause it's been all since day, since that clans we play, now where else can I say, it's the same every day, son of a kid, I say, I'll play that, it's a problem, a problem if nobody sees, you know what I mean If no one's in the forest to hear the sound of the trees Go to Winston Shaman, my army dance speed That's why me said they keep them can breathe Please, just do me a favor And I explain the data In a sound, in a song, not words on paper So I'm going to stop it there, but you could probably hear just as the word January came in, the drone started to get really, really loud. So that's the final result and that's the final video. But I'm going to dig a little bit more into the process of actually making the, the first sound layer, the sonification. So once I had the data from Open Data Bristol, I had to make several decisions. The first one was about time mapping. So how to convert the data time into musical time. Lots of sonifications like this one are based on time series data because sound itself unfolds over time. So all you're doing is converting or mapping the time scale of your data to the time scale of your sonification. And normally that's by compressing it. So one of the first decisions we make when creating sonifications at loud numbers is how long do we want the track to be roughly? Do we want it to be a 20 second Instagram clip? Do we want it to be a three minute pop song? Or do we wanna have some enormous expansive 24 hour long sonic artwork? So here I knew that I wanted the track needed to be about four to eight minutes long because that's kind of the, the, the length of a standard pop song. And once I knew the approximate duration of my sonification, this then helped guide me towards the system that I'd use to convert data time into musical time. So in Bristol Burning, each passing day of data is represented by one beat of music at a tempo of 78 beats per minute. And the final track was just under five minutes long. When making a musical sonification like this, it's often a good idea to map data time units like days or weeks if you're using time series data to musical time units like beats or bars because these are things that people can actually hear in the sound 
rather than abstract time units like seconds or minutes, which they can't hear. So next, I had to decide how to map the data values themselves into sound. And you have a lot of options here. If you're familiar with making charts, it can be quite useful to think about them in visual terms because sonification and visualization work in quite similar ways in this respect. In 1967, the French cartographer Jacques Bertin came up with this idea of visual variables, which he defined as position, size, shape, brightness, hue, orientation, and texture. In a similar way, Duncan and I have created a list of some of the parameters of sound that can be mapped to data, and we've called these sonic variables. They can include things like pitch, volume, type of sound, meaning the instrument or the timbre used, various aspects of timing, which incorporates sound duration, tempo, the rhythm, the number of sounds per time period, and much more. It can include pan, that's the spatial position in the audio field from left to right, and it can include numerous effects such as filter, filters, reverb or distortion. All of these things and more can be used to encode and communicate data values. And you can also double or triple encode by using more than one of them at once. So we found in our experience that certain sonic variables work better than others in certain situations. Some, these are the ones near the top of this graphic, communicate data values with more precision, um, like pitch. Others near the bottom, communicate with less precision, but perhaps more impact, like volume or reverb. And definitely some are easier for untrained or non-musical audiences to grasp than others. And this is the left-right position on this chart. One of the most commonly used mappings is pitch. So as the numbers get larger, the notes get higher. Here's what the 12 numbers from Bristol Burning <clears throat> would have sounded like mapped instead to musical notes played back using a piano sound. So this is okay, it's quite precise. You can hear the readings go up twice when the data spikes in the middle, and then you can hear them go down at the end. Pitch can be an effective mapping if you want precision, as most people are pretty good at hearing quite small pitch differences. But I've got to say, this is a bit boring. And for this project, I wanted something that packed more of a punch. So I mapped the data instead to a kind of audio effect, the cutoff of a low pass filter. I started with a basic drone sound and it already sounded pretty menacing. You heard it earlier, but crucially it had lots of overtones, lots of harmonics in the sound. And then I applied the low pass filter to the drone. So the filter was mapped to the air quality data so that the higher the pollution levels, the higher the cutoff. So here's a bit about what that actually means. There are a bunch of different types of filters you can use. And as the name implies, they all filter out part of a sound. So in these charts, you've got frequency on the x-axis, that's low bassy sounds on the left, and high tinny sounds on the right of each chart. And you've got high pass filters, that's the second image on the top row here. So these cut off the lower sounds and they let the higher sounds pass through. And then you've got low pass filters, that's the first image. They do the opposite. They chop off the higher sounds and then they let the lower ones pass through. And the cutoff point is the frequency where the filter starts to kick in. So if you use a low pass filter and you have a low cutoff, the sound is quite muffled and quite rumbly because you're cutting out pretty much everything except the bass. And then when you turn up the cutoff, the sound gets brighter and harsher because now mid and high frequencies are getting through as well. And it's really important that the sound that you start with contains both low and high frequencies, like the drone that I used, because you need something there to actually filter out. So in a spreadsheet, I scaled these 12 data points that I had, these are my inputs, to the output values for the filter using min-max normalization. And then in Logic Pro, which is the same software that I used to make the music, I plotted these 12 output values on the drone track using an automation curve on the low pass filter. And that's the blue line on the top track um, this time. So it looks a little bit like a flatter version of the original chart I showed earlier. You can see it's got the two peaks in it. And then I also mapped some of the other tracks like the kick drum and the bass to another parameter, volume. But this time I did them, I mapped them in an inverse way so that as the pollution levels increase, the sound gets quieter. And these are the three level uh, yellow lines on the three tracks below the blue one. 
So the effect that this creates is more like the drone is drowning out the music. Sorry, the drone is drowning out the music. And it also helps to avoid overloading the listener's ears. So as I only had 12 data points, this very manual approach was not too much hassle. But normally at loud numbers, we're dealing with much larger data sets. And we use a sonification tool to do the mapping in a more automated way. And I'll briefly mention some examples of tools you can use at the end of this talk. It took a little while to settle on this particular sonification system. So before creating the final track, I made some what you could call audio sketches. Uh, to make these, I used the Loud Numbers VCV Rack module and Sonic Pi, and I'll introduce those at the end. I considered using wind and temperature data as well as air quality, but I actually dropped this idea just to keep it focused on, on air quality. I played around with a few different mappings. I played around with volume, reverb, high pass filter, before eventually settling on the low pass filter for the main mapping. And I considered using daily rather than monthly averages. So here's an e early audio sketch that I made with daily data mapped to a low pass filter. So it's kind of interesting, like it's quite, um, varies on a local level. You can really hear those changes from day to day. But when you listen to the whole thing, you can't really hear the large scale seasonal trend. It gets lost in, in the day to day variation. And the sound just seems to kind of whirl around randomly. So I stuck with monthly because it had a simpler, clearer pattern. So here's a summary of the whole process for creating this track. I downloaded the data, I cleaned it, and then I explored it using lots of exploratory plots. And Duncan and I often visualize data before sonifying it because the chart gives a really quick overview of key trends. And in this case, I could see the clear seasonal trend that is the focus of the track. And then at the same time, I made the backing track, I made the music in Logic, which is not mapped to any data. Not every element of your sonification needs to encode data in the same way that visualizations can contain icons, illustrations, and other images that aren't mapped to any numbers. At the same time, I made some audio sketches in VCV Rack and Sonic Pi. I developed a sonification system by working out what mapping to use, in this case, a low pass filter, and how granular the data should be. Should I use daily or monthly averages? I next had to scale the data. So working out what the minimum and maximum values for the filter cut cutoff should be. Then I plotted the values into logic using the automation curves on the drone track. Then I mixed the sonification and the music together uh, that I recorded and mixed the vocals, applied some nice audio effects, mixed down the track across all three layers, and finally got it professionally mastered by a studio called Sorting Room. So this is kind of a messy diagram. The whole process looks messy and iterative because it really was. There was a lot of bouncing back and forth between data, sonification, and music to find the best possible solution. So that's Bristol Burning. I hope you've enjoyed the talk, but before I go, I just want to share some uh, useful resources that might help if you're interested in trying out sonification for yourself. Here's a grid showing the landscape of sonification tools on offer. So on the left, you've got simpler tools, and on the right, you've got more complicated, more powerful ones. At the top are the ones that require no coding skills, and near the bottom, you'll need more and more advanced coding skills, knowledge, and experience to get a good result. In the lower right, you'll find many sonification tools that are quite complicated to use and require some coding knowledge, including Sonic Pi, Max MSP, and SuperGlider. And then in the top left here, you've got the simplest tools like Two-Tone. If you're an absolute beginner to working with sound, then Two-Tone is a really good place to start. It's a web-based tool, and you can easily upload a CSV or use one of the preloaded data sets to make a simple pitch-based sonification in about two minutes. It's free and it doesn't require any coding knowledge and it's really great for getting to grips with the basics. Another web-based tool that was released very recently is called Data Sonifier. It's super easy to use, it involves no code and you can map a data set to up to six different audio parameters including filters, effects and rhythm. And the tool exists in both English and German language versions. If you're a musician, whether that's a pro or an amateur, and you're looking to experiment with something a little bit more powerful, then this is the Loud Numbers module for the modular synth simulator VCV Rack, which you can download for free from vcvrack.com. Duncan made this tool, and it allows you to tap into VCV Rack's huge library of audio manipulation modules. 
enabling you to use data to modify almost any aspect of the sound, depending on how the cables are connected up. There is a learning curve here, but it's far smaller than the requirement to learn how to code. And there's lots of tutorials on YouTube that can help you get to grips with the basics. If you are into coding or up for learning a bit, you might want to try Sonic Pi, which is another free program that uses the Ruby programming language. You can download it from sonicpi.net. It's pretty powerful, and the built-in tutorial materials are very easy for beginners to follow. We actually made most of the sonifications for the Loud Numbers podcast using Sonic Pi. If you want to find out more and collect with like -minded, connect with like-minded sonification enthusiasts, then you can join our Decibels community at decibels.community. Everyone is super friendly and everyone who joins says they don't feel qualified to be there. So if you don't feel qualified, then you'll be in great company. Decibels has lots of beginner resources, including a dedicated GitHub page with a super useful page called Sonification Resources on it. It's got tips and tools and techniques, including some code snippets for getting started with sonification in Sonic Pi. So do have a look. And if you want to listen to more sonifications, there's hundreds of examples in the data sonification archive at sonification.design. You can find loads of inspiration there. Finally, it would be remiss of me not to give a final plug to our studio, Loud Numbers. Duncan and I are always on the lookout for interesting projects, so do feel free to contact us if you'd like to chat to find out if we can work together or pass on our details. Email us at uh, numbersloud at gmail.com. And we also do a newsletter. It's quite irregular, but we round up what we've been doing, what's been happening in the wider sonification community. And you can sign up on our website. Thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions. Mm -hmm.